It's a pleasure to introduce the last speaker of the day, Alex Wilkie, who is Field and Professor of Pure Mathematics at Manchester University in the United Kingdom. And he's going to speak to us about the relevance of logic to transcendental number theory. And we very much look forward to this talk. Thank you, Alex. OK, so this is um, really just an introduction to Jonathan's, Jonathan Peeler's talk tomorrow to basically describe the, the model theory, the logic and model theory involved in um, his latest results. So uh, I'll start with, with the number theory and um, give you the... Uh, the idea of the number theory before I come on to why uh, logic is, is relevant. So let's start with the, um, what we could call the, well now justify as calling the Bombieri-Peeler, or what I'll call theory, uh, which is, uh, there's many papers, I think starting from 1989, still going, um, and the basic goal of this theory um, is the following. Uh, find upper bounds uh, for the density um, of rational points. Uh, in the transcendental part <clears throat> of a set X, just a subset of n-dimensional Euclidean space, uh, for various classes, well, let's say interesting classes, It's a very general program of sets X of collections, well, various classes of sets X. Okay, so the underlying terms there I'll define in due course. Uh, even though I'm a logician, I haven't underlined the word set. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, which no doubt you'll be very relieved about. Uh, um. <clears throat> okay, so that's the goal. That I'll leave the definitions of density and transcendental part for a little while. I first have to define heights, which I'm sure most of you know about, but let's just fix our ideas. And then in terms of these heights, we'll define that term density. Uh, so if Q is a rational number, say Q is just A over B in its lowest terms, so we'll suppose that A is an integer, B is a positive integer, uh, the greatest common divisor, AB equals 1. Uh, then the height of Q is just uh, the maximum of the numerator and modulus of the numerator and denominator. And um, uh, for a tuple, we just take the maximum of the heights of the coordinates. Uh, everything here can be done for algebraic number fields as well, um, but I'm going to stick to rational numbers for the, for the entire talk. So uh, just the height of the tuple is just the maximum. the heights of the entries there. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so now for, uh, probably best to do the other one, yeah? <clears throat> um, okay, so uh, for X a subset of R to the N, 
Um, and t, a natural number, uh, we'll use the notation you'll see a lot in Jonathan's talk tomorrow. Xtn uh, is just defined to be the uh, set of rational points on x such that the height is bounded by t. <clears throat> this talk is not particularly sensitive to that definition of height. There are, of course, many in algebraic number theory, but uh, this is fine for us. Okay, so, um, so the, the density, we really mean uh, the rate of growth, the density of rational points on X, we mean the rate of growth of the cardinality of that set, which is obviously a finite set, as t tends to infinity. So that's the, the aim of the theory. Um, now the trouble is, um, x may contain lots of subsets that obviously have many rational points on. For instance, if n is greater than or equal to 2, it may have lots of lines in it. Um, so we want to avoid those. Uh, this, this subject is not about uh, finding rational points on algebraic curves and surfaces and so on. It's not about solving algebraic equations in rationals. It's more about finding bounds on the solutions of transcendental equations in rationals. So we, um, so we rule out uh, uh, the algebraic points. Uh, that requires some care. Um, so the goal, well, let me just say for the moment, the goal is the same as... Um, finding uh, upper bounds uh, or an upper bound for various x's for the cardinality um, of this set, uh, but not the set, uh, what we'll later call the transcendental part of the set. So we're not interested in rational points here on, on algebraic subsets. So um, finding upper bounds for that um, as t tends to infinity. And here, x trans is what I've called the transcendental part of x over there. Uh, so, oops. Okay. Um, let me just do a quick diversion into something called semi-algebraic sets. <clears throat> okay, so uh, subset Y is called semi-algebraic. Well, we all know what algebraic means, just the set of solutions of a, um, a polynomial equation. Um, but over the reals, we, we take the ordering into account. So, um, so it's called semi-algebraic if it lies in the uh, in subalgebra of subsets of R to the N um, containing so the small um, well the smallest subalgebra of subsets of R to the N containing uh, both the zero sets of polynomials I'll just call that ZP and the positivity sets of polynomials no I'll call it ZQ because I'm just going to use P <coughs> and the positivity sets uh, of polynomials So as Q varies over, um, well, where Q is a polynomial in N variables, but you, you have a choice, uh, 
well, let, let's say with real coefficients. One, one has more subtle theories if you restrict the coefficients. But <clears throat> okay, so you take any, you take all the polynomials in n variables, just look at the sets you get this way and this way, and then close off under finite unions, finite intersections, and complementation. Uh, so it's not a sigma algebra, just, just an algebra. Right. So that's a semi-algebraic set. And we want to avoid those in that consideration. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think I've got this the wrong way around. Never mind. Uh, <clears throat> All right. Um, in our consideration of rational points. So uh, for X, um, any subset of R to the N, uh, the algebraic part of X is now defined to be, I have to be, as I say, a little bit careful here, otherwise you'll remove everything, um, you'll consider everything. It's uh, obviously not the union of all the algebraic subsets, that would include all the points, but it's the union um, of all the infinite um, connected, just for the subspace topology on R to the N, um, semi-algebraic subsets of N. It's not the intersection with X of semi-algebraic subsets. It's uh, you just take all the semi-algebraic infinite connected sets that happen to be subsets of X and take the union of all of them. That will not in general be a semi-algebraic set. Um, for example, uh, if you just take the set of solutions of X, Y equals Z, uh, the semi-algebraic, the Algebraic part of this is the union of all the um, x, y, z you get when y is rational and x to the y equals z. So uh, it's definitely not a semi-algebraic set. Okay, and then, so now I, I just define the transcendental part of x is just, defi just defined to be x minus the uh, algebraic part. Okay, so we've got through giving all the definitions of the general goal of the bombieri peeler theory. So let me give... Except the word interesting. Uh, except the... <laughs> okay, so I'm just coming up to that. And, uh, right, so the first um, uh, result was in, I believe, answer to a question of Peter Sarnak. Um, uh, so interesting for us is... Uh, well, okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, section four on the first big theorems of the subject. So this is Bombieri Pila. As I say, in response, I believe, to um, a question of Peter Sarnak. Uh, well, our phrase, it probably didn't say it exactly like this, but this is sort of what it amounts to. Um, so, let, so we're going to look at the question of when an analytic function, an analytic non-algebraic function, takes rational values for rational arguments of given height. Okay, so that's what this theorem's about. So let f from 0, 1 to r be a transcendental uh, transcendental um, real analytic uh, function and here and we're going to take x to be the graph so 
the graph of f. So just all the pairs x, f of x. Um, OK, transcendental means it just doesn't satisfy any equation p of x, f of x equals 0 um, on any interval uh, where p is a polynomial. Real analytic just means around every point, and it's important that 0 and 1 are included here, around every point uh, it converges to its, uh, or it's equal to its convergent Taylor series. Um, that's really, although you have different Taylor series about different points. Okay, so that's the hypothesis. And um, so the theorem is then for all positive epsilon uh, and for all natural numbers t, or for all real numbers t, the number, the cardinality of xqt, so what is that? That is the cardinality of the set of rational points of height at most t such that f takes a rational value of height at most t is bounded by a constant depending on x and epsilon multiplied by t to the epsilon. <coughs> okay, so for every positive power of t, the number of rational points of height at most t at which f takes a rational value of height at most t is bounded by t to the epsilon, constant times t to the epsilon. Uh, it doesn't seem perhaps at first sight that great. Perhaps you were hoping for log t or something like that, but that's not true. This is best possible. Well, in a suitable sense. You, you can't put any function of t here that goes to zero. <clears throat> oh, well, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, I mean, in general, that works for all x. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so, uh, and the question was to generalize this to, say, analytic functions or possibly even other functions of more than one variable. problem, extend this result to, um, well, let's say real analytic. You might want to generalize that a little bit, but you certainly can't go to C infinity here, um, to real analytic functions uh, f from 0, 1 to the n to r. <coughs> um, and you'd want the same bound. Um, I mean, obviously you can get a bound that might depend on n that wouldn't go to 0, but um, uh, to functions, so with the same bound. So that was the question that time, and there were several papers just after 1989 that uh, did things for two variable functions and various other variations of that, but um, uh, not, not the general case. Okay, so now I'm going to give you the general number theoretic lemma that's used to, to attack these problems. I'm just going to have it put it on a slide and we'll treat it as just a black box that's there and that's the only number theory I'm going to mention and then the rest I'm just going to tell you a bit about the logic that's used in order to arrange the information we have here into a form for which the number theoretic lemma can be used. Okay, so there's kind of the two parts of the talk. The number theoretic part which I'm going to give now explain in about five, ten minutes and then show how the information, as I said, can be arranged to make it work. So, uh, so this is section five, a number theoretic lemma. So this is uh, the key Fondieri Peeler result. Uh, it's a kind of version. Well, I won't. No, I'd say almost nothing about the proof. It, it involves 
theory of van der Mont determinants and things. Uh, and I'm going to put it on the slide because it's rather long, so I will spend some time trying to motivate it right. So, so this is it. So let's fix a k and n with 0 less than k less than n. Oh, I should have mentioned, since we're removing all algebraic sets, in particular, if we're in n space, we're moving all balls. So the, the set... The tra the X trans cannot have interior. Okay, so, I mean, that's obviously necessary for any result to work in this form. So I'm going to fix K and N. N is going to be the ambient dimension, and K is going to be the dimension of the set we're looking at, assuming it's in a class of sets for which dimension makes sense. Uh, okay, so the result says this. There is a function R from N to N. Now think of that as fairly rapidly increasing. And then there's a function epsilon from n to positive reals going to zero probably very slowly, um, given we're in the worst of all possible worlds, with the following property. Um, right, now you give me any d um, and any mapping from uh, zero, one to the k, the open unit box uh, in k space to r to the n, n is bigger. So you think of this as mapping out some kind of surface in r to the n. And the r has got to be, sorry, the map has got to be sufficiently differentiable. So uh, that's given by this function r, so of class c r to r of d. So r of d times continuously differentiable with all its derivatives up to r d bounded by 1. So uh, I'm just using the multi-index notation there. Alpha is uh, a k-tuple uh, of natural numbers, uh, sorry, of positive, of non-negative integers, and that's the alpha derivative there. Um, and I demand that the supremum of these functions, uh, of these derivatives up to where they exist, is bounded by one. Okay. So given any function like that, um, we have that XQT, the set of rational points on X, which is here the range of phi. So um, taking just this image in R to the N, uh, the number of rational points on that image of height at most T, uh, well, we can't have a... is actually contained... So here's the many variable version of the result is contained in the union of a constant times t to the epsilon algebraic hypersurfaces of degree at most d, that is, not alpha. Okay, so you give me a d, and then so providing the functions are sufficiently differentiable with bounded derivatives, uh, all their rational points of height at most t um, are, are on algebraic surfaces. Now, that's not to say algebraic hypersurfaces that are contained in X. That's just they are on certain algebraic hypersurfaces of degree at most D. D is the number you're first given, and R of D is the amount of differentiability you need um, to get it less than epsilon, uh, T to the epsilon rational points. Okay, I'll just give a moment for that. Uh, no, because no, because um, k is strictly less than n. So it, I mean, providing it's one times differentiable, it, it um, <coughs> yeah. So we need k at least, yeah, k is at least one. So, uh, oh, sorry, the the amount of differentiability will guarantee that. <coughs> It would be a strictly lower dimensional thing. Okay, so, um, but that uh, doesn't, actually I can keep that there. Um, that doesn't in itself um, help us 
well, it doesn't completely solve the problem because these hypersurfaces are not actually contained in X. Uh, obviously, um, well, we need um, some kind of inductive procedure to now go down to looking at the set, set X intersected with all these hypersurfaces. Um, okay, so let me just, so uh, to apply this, Uh, to some, uh, let's say, y contained in r to the n, uh, well, we've got to do two things. We must, first of all, uh, represent y um, as um, the image, the range of phi for such a phi. Well, for the sets we're interested in, usually that will be given. Um, it'll be the image of a, probably of an analytic function or something like that. Um, but the real problem is, um, we're going to have to look at the original set intersected with an arbitrary algebraic hypersurface. So um, we've got to actually, in order to apply the lemma again, represent uh, y intersect h. Um, in this form as the image of a suitably differentiable function uh, where H is one of the <coughs> of the uh, algebraic hypersurfaces. Oh, an algebraic hypersurface is just the zero of a polynomial here, right? Um, not necessarily irreducible. Um, and it, we're in the real, so you can always suppose it's just a single polynomial, each hypersurface taking sums of squares or something like that. <coughs> um, okay, so um, we've got to actually prove a theorem not just about the original set we're given, but the intersection of the set with an arbitrary algebraic hypersurface, and then it might be far from obvious that we can represent that set as the image of functions phi, like, like this. And so this is where the, the topic of O minimality um, comes in. <coughs> so... Uh, Six O minimal structures. <clears throat> okay, so this theory, uh, well, was first developed over the reals um, by Van den Dries, I guess in the eighties, uh, but then uh, given a more general model theoretic context by <laughs> Pillay and Steinhorn, uh, who studied it over arbitrary real closed fields and even more general uh, base spaces. Um, and it's actually important, in fact, uh, to do that for various uniformity results, but I won't get to do that. Now, um, yeah, this is rather a long definition, so... Um, I've got this on a slide as well. <clears throat> so I'm giving the slight draft. The slightly cheating version of uh, no, I thought it would do that. Uh, in that I'm never gonna mention the logical formula. Um, so uh, Okay, so the setting for o, o minimality, at least as far as we're concerned, is this. Um, we're given a collection of subsets of R to the N, just totally arbitrary for the moment, um, for each N. So and I let curly S just be the disjoint union of that whole bunch of things. Um, as again, these will be of some interest, one, one presumes. Um, and... 
we define the logical closure uh, of this collection, S, call it S tilde, as the smallest collection containing S, containing the semi-algebraic sets and closed under the standard first order logical operations, which are as follows. So, Sn tilde contains Sn and also contains every semi-algebraic subset of R to the N. We start with those and we close under the following operations. Uh, the first one is the Boolean operations, intersect, finite intersection, finite union, and complementation. Uh, direct products, if A is a set in Sn tilde and B in Sn tilde, then we declare that A cross B has to be in Sn plus M tilde. And finally, uh, if we have a set in Sn plus 1 tilde, and we look at its, the image under the projection on the first n coordinates, uh, then that should also be in S n tilde. Okay. Now what you do in logic is you actually introduce a language that describes these operations. Um, and it's much easier to give examples if, I've, if I do that uh, as to what sets you get in S tilde. Um, but I haven't really time here for that. So that's just, um, that so far is just the definition of logical closure of an arbitrary collection of subsets of R to the N for each N. Uh, what makes it O-minimal, so this is the O-minimality axiom, uh, that word or phrase comes from, minim well, minimality, you'll see why in a second. The O just stands for order, meaning we're sort of interested in the order topology. Um, is the following. It's just a restriction on the sets we get in S1, so just the subsets of the real line. So we say the original collection S is O minimal if uh, the only sets that we get in S1 uh, are just finite unions of intervals, half open, half closed, open. Points count as intervals here. Uh, in other words, that we only get sets in S1 that have finitely many connected components. And the minimality refers to the fact that, well, we've got to have those because they're semi-algebraic. So um, uh, it says you don't get anything more in S1. It seems slightly ad hoc, but uh, it does have uh, considerable consequences. Um, for example, uh, oh, okay, so some logical terminology. Um, I'm only introducing this because I know I'm bound to say this word, and uh, um, uh, so I'll introduce it. If A is in, um, say, Sn tilde, um, we say uh, A is definable. And that's the logical word. Over, over S. So it just means you can get it from these operations um, from the sets in S and the semi-algebraic sets. Oh, uh, another, uh, that's, so that's one, and we say a function <coughs> F or a map, oh no, no, sorry, a function, um, F from R to the N to R is definable, is called definable, if its graph is. Um, if, in other words, its graph is a subset um, of R to the N plus 1, which is definable. Okay, so that's just some ter terminology. And... Um, Okay, just a few quick things one can prove uh, just to illustrate the, the power of that O-minimality axiom. <coughs> um, so, sample theorems. Uh, this is for SO minimal. Are that, um, for instance, um, F 
if f from r to r uh, is definable, then it's uh, continuous at all but finitely many points, and even then f is uh, CR for any given r um, at all but finitely many points. So it's very good for doing all points. Does may increase with R. Um, how does examples of that known now? Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, and um, F definable implies uh, any particular derivative, if it's in several variables, is definable wherever it exists. Uh, if you use proper logical notation, that's actually... Um, fairly clear because you just use the usual epsilon delta definition of derivatives and that can be expressed using, uh, using these operations. Let me just mention one very surprising fact which is highly non-obvious about definability in no minimal structures. Um, yeah, what I've said here is, um, oh sorry, what here, this is true without the O-minimality axiom. I mean, it just follows from the usual definite ways of defining the derivative. But one thing that does need the O-minimality axiom is that if you have a function from R to the N plus 1 to R, if that's definable, then the set of points in R to the N, such that, say, the integral from 0 to infinity of Fx t dt is finite, that is definable. Now, that is very non-obvious. There's no obvious way using these operations to describe that set. Um, and that, you have to take a very global view uh, in, uh, of, those, of what functions you get there and, um, and use the structure of those functions in order to, to prove this. You, you could, okay, so this is a, actually a theorem of Kaiser, Tobias Kaiser from <clears throat> anyway, uh, so those are the properties you have of O minimal structures. Let me give some examples. Um, of O minimal structures. Or what the S tilde is uh, for certain given S's. Um, so, examples. Uh, well, of O minimality, the way I've described it, that have been established over the last 20, 25 years or so. Uh, actually, for giving examples, it's, it's easier to say what the, uh, to describe them in terms, to think of SN as a collection of functions rather than a collection of sets. Uh, this just means that the graph of these functions are in the one dimension higher. So uh, I'll give examples by uh, just giving functions where I mean the graphs of the functions. So this is Tarski's theorem that there does exist a no-minimal structure. Um, so if I take, so by definition, Sn alg is just the polynomial ring. <coughs> so I just take all polynomials as my Sn, or rather their graphs. Uh, and then the Sn tilde, Sn alg tilde, in this case, is then just the semi-algebraic sets, semi-algebraic subsets of R to the N. Uh, that's obvious, well, that I get all semi-algebraic subsets is clear, but the fact, Tarski's theorem, is that that's all you get. Uh, <coughs> Uh, so a while back I proved that if instead of just the polynomials you take, so this collection I'll call Sn exp, if you take the polynomials not just in x1 up to xm but their exponentials, real exponentials, uh, that generates an O-minimal structure. Um, here the Sn tilde uh, turns out to be um, 
Well, it's the actual projections of zero sets of exponential polynomials. So it's uh, difficult to describe, but This is as p varies over uh, p a polynomial. So, uh, sorry, p uh, in in here. Uh, that's there now. So, uh, so, so the essence of the point of this theorem is that if you look at the con closure conditions, um, the only one that's not obviously satisfied. You see, they're all satisfied rather obviously by that collection of sets, except for complementation. So essentially the theorem is if you take a subset of R to the N, that's the projection of um, uh, an the zero set of an exponential polynomial, then you can write the complement also as the projection of a zero set of another exponential polynomial. And this turns out to be um, O minimal. Um, Another example, <coughs> and the one we're interested in, I guess, for the number theoretic application, is uh, where you take, um, uh, so that's two, three, I'll call this, this is traditionally called R an, this one, um, but I'm just going to call it S n an, is. Um, I just take all real analytic functions, or they, the graphs of real analytic functions, f from any. Uh, it's very important this is the closed interval again to r. Um, and then Sn and tilde turns out to be, uh, well, what's sometimes called all globally subanalytic sets. End. So, uh, yeah, the subanalytic sets are too big. I mean, they include the integers, for example, things like that. This is just all the, those subsets of R to the N, uh, which are still subanalytic when you consider them as subsets uh, of projective space R to the N. Or, um, so they're analytic at infinity as well as every finite point. Uh, so that. Uh, so this is a theorem. The fact that that equals that is due to Gabrielov. And then finally, you can put these theorem of McIntyre, Marker, and Van den Dries uh, is that you can put these two together. So uh, so we'll call S N and X we can take, well, literally to be the union, uh, Sn and union Snx. So you can take all real analytic functions on, on compact boxes uh, together with the full exponential uh, function, with, um, the graph of which is not a globally subanalytic set because the exponential function is not analytic at infinity. Um, but you can, you still get no minimal structure. Um, so I won't say what the tilde is, it's rather complicated to define, but it is, you don't never get any subsets of the reals that are other than intervals and, and points. Okay, so those are the examples. <coughs> but it's number three that will give us the number theoretic application. So I'm now going back to... Um, uh, the general theory of O minimal structures, uh, that axiom um, that uh, every, oh, all right, so let, sorry, let S be uh, O minimal. So when you take the logical closure, you only get subsets of R that are finite unions of intervals, but you can actually prove from that that every 
A in Sn tilde has uh, only finitely many connected components. By the way, if you want to see all the proofs of these facts, uh, then Van den Dries has a book called Tame Topology and O Minimal Structures. Uh, okay, so uh, one can just prove from the assumption that subsets of R have only finitely many connected components, the power of logical definability, having that hypothesis for all logically definable sets from the original S, forces uh, this, that even... Uh, subsets of R to the N have only finitely many connected components. And the main result, perhaps, um, for the number theoretic uh, application is the reparameterization re lemma. Okay, so this should be the this is the, probably the starting point of Jonathan's talk. This is due to Tila and myself. Um, so there's a, there's a theorem in subanalytic geometry uh, that says every subanalytic set can be expressed as a finite union of images under analytic functions of disks. Um, and this is a kind of generalization of, or rather it's a version of that, the general O minimal structures. Um, oh, well, perhaps I should say that the many of the, well, at least qualitative finiteness theorems that you have for semi-algebraic sets and semi-analytic and sub-analytic sets uh, can be proved in the general setting of O minimal structures. So you, so you get... Um, a lot of the theory of semi-algebraic sets and semi-analytic sets just from this O-minimality axiom. Um, okay, well, this is a bit like what's called the uniformization theorem. Uh, so it says the following, that X contained in R to the D be definable. So that just means it's in S tilde D. And let's take any natural number at R, uh, then there exists a finite collection <coughs> of definable CR functions. R times continuously differentiable uh, phi i of various numbers of arguments, so let's say mapping 0, 1 to the r i to r to the d, for i less than or equal to some actually very large natural number n, such that a is the union of their ranges, sorry, x, x here, is the union the ranges of these sets and B uh, they have the bounded derivative so for all I and for all alpha in N for an RI tuple of uh, yeah well sorry that should be uh, natural numbers with zero um, with mod alpha, that's just the sum of the coordinates of alpha, less than or equal to r, the, uh, we have the bound uh, on the derivatives that we want. So the sup over x bar in 0, 1 to the ri of mod phi i alpha x bar uh, is less than or equal to <clears throat> so the reparameterization lemma just says you take any definable set at all, you can find definable functions such that it's the union of the images of those functions 
uh, and the functions have bounded derivative up to any given R. Of course, this, this capital N here, um, where's it gone? Here, will increase very rapidly with the, with the R, with the, the amount of differentiability you want, but uh, that turns out not to matter. Well, that would matter if you wanted better results on the number of rational points, but just for the result I stated, it doesn't. So we now get the corollary. So it's now almost, all, well, no, it's not automatic, but it's now quite easy to use that number theoretic lemma, providing we prove, try and prove something for all definable sets, not just images of analytic functions or anything like that. So we take any O minimal structure and we prove the following for all definable sets. So let, and then the induction goes through because we never have to leave sets that can be defined using these logical operations. So let X in R D be definable. <coughs> So I'll just remind you, for an O minimal S, <coughs> then, I'm sure you know what I'm going to say now, for all epsilon greater than zero, uh, if I look at the transcendental part of X, which, by the way, is not definable, that in general won't be definable, uh, but nevertheless, we can still prove <clears throat> this result is less than or equal to a constant depending on the set X, depending on epsilon times T to the epsilon. Um, so EG, <clears throat> if we take S to be S an, where we have in S all graphs and, and therefore images of um, analytic functions on closed unit boxes, um, we can apply this. To um, x equal the graph of f <coughs> for analytic functions f. Um, to to well, thereby solving the original problem that I stated. The bombieri peeler result for higher dimensions. Mm. But when, if you look at the proof, you'll have to go through many different definable sets that won't necessarily be the images of analytic functions, but you never actually leave the definable sets. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <coughs> <clears throat> Any questions? Yeah. Ah. Okay. Now that's that's an interesting point. It was it's really Van den Dries's observation that, well, there is an example going back to Osgood that shows. Well, it's the example of a subanalytic set that's not semi-analytic, which can be seen as saying that this um, class S an does not have quantifier elimination. Now, Van den Dries's observation was that doesn't really matter that if for qualitative geometric results. The point is that it, it should be O-minimal. When you close under definability, it doesn't matter that you can't eliminate the quantifiers. As long as you never get complicated subsets of the reals, uh, you still have all the nice geometric and topological properties you want. Uh, in fact, it's very hard to actually prove something is O-minimal unless you have some elimination theory. Uh, but it doesn't have to be complete elimination down to the quantifier free sets. Like, in, in SN, you get elimination down to the ex what we call existentially definable sets. The same is true for SX. You get it down to existentially quantifiers, and, and uh, that's usually enough to be able to prove uh, O minimality.